Well, good evening. So, ICU Talks has completely wrecked me. <laughs> now, I realize that's a generational word because I learned it from my teenager. So if you're my age or older, what that means is that it's a synonym for it's impacted me in a really good, like God created the beaches and the oceans kind of way. <laughs> so it's wrecked me for the last two and a half years because that's how long I've been a part of this ministry. And it's wrecked me the last three weeks because I had a nice, comfortable, cozy talk to give for the last seven months. And three weeks ago, God said, "Uh uh-uh. And he dropped a new talk into my heart, and I've been wrestling with him ever since. In fact, I came close to bailing. I tried to get food poisoning. (laughs) (laughs) I'm just, I'm not convinced that this story matters to anyone else but me. And then I was wrecked again tonight with Karen's and Naomi's story. Thank you. And I don't have a fancy iPad. I'm old school. (laughs) And I was up till 11 o'clock last night putting finishing touches on this. So I've got paper. And I'm going to be okay with that. Because you're not supposed to be judgmental tonight, right? (laughs) None of our speakers, none of them, none from the past, none from tonight, none of our future speakers, are bringing any new truths to the stage. The truths are set. God's word is unchanging. What we do is we bring our stories, and we act as kind of like color commentators to the scriptures. We add our own personalities. We add our experiences. We add our character. And what that does is it helps some people resonate with our stories and understand God's truth better. So some of you may have resonated with Karen's story. Some of you may have resonated with Naomi's, and some of you may resonate with mine. The underlying truth in all of our stories is the simple gospel. And if you know the gospel, then you know how all of our stories end. Actually, maybe a better way to say that is if if you know the gospel, you know our stories never end. I've become pretty well known for one of my stories. Probably because it's a doozy of a story. And let's face it, with that story, I've kind of been an open book. (laughs) That is seriously the only funny thing I have tonight, so. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Ay, ay, (sighs) ay. Seriously, though, I'm kind of sick of my story. But don't worry. I mean, I'm still pursuing sharing it because it's God's desire to wreck others with it. And I'm good with that. But there's inherent danger in only being remembered by or associated with one story. It starts to become our identity. And we are not the product of just one story. We are who we are because of many stories, many experiences, relationships, circumstances, our own choices. Some are good and some are bad. But each of us have thousands of stories. I am not just a forgiving spouse of a recovered sex addict. I am not just the adoptive mother of two children from across the world. And I am not just the extremely grateful and proud owner of a super cool hashtag ultramodern home. (laughs) So let's talk about who we are, who we all are. If you'll go ahead and put that first slide up. My talk tonight is really based on one scripture. You can go to the scripture. (laughs) Thanks. (laughs) It's 1 Thessalonians 5.23, and it says, Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. So if you go to the next slide, what that tells us is that we are three-dimensional beings. We have a body. That's the vessel that we use to interact with each other and with this world in. And I'm not just talking about the cute shoes. I'm talking about our senses. I'm talking about how we touch things, how we see things, how we hear things, 
how we smell things. That's our physical being. Then we have a spiritual dimension. If you're a Christ follower, that's the Holy Spirit inside you. He dwells within us. We have his power. And you may, you know, that's just kind of like what people refer to as the God-shaped or God-sized holes. I just drew it out that way for you because it's easier for me to see in picture form. That's just how my mind works. And you might hear of those, you know, super powerful, ultra-rich, really successful in an earthly sense people say, you know, I had everything I wanted in life, but I still felt like I was missing something. That's that spiritual dimension. But the dimension I want to talk about the most tonight is the soul dimension. The soul is made up of three parts. You can go to the next slide. It's our mind. Some people say our thoughts. It's our emotions or feelings. And it's our will or our choices. And how these all interact is they're intertwined. If you take one out, you're not going to function very well. In fact, your thoughts and your mind influence your emotions, right? Have you heard the term garbage in, garbage out? If your life and your mind and what you hear, what goes through your physical dimension, through your ears, into your soul, is negative, or it's labels. Naomi talked about labels. If it's um, care, you know, categorizations, if it's lies from the enemy, then your feelings and emotions will be affected. You will, may feel rejected. You may feel down. You may f not feel worthy. You may feel shame. And those thoughts and those feelings are going to affect your choices, your will. You know, we were not made to be robots. We were given free will by our creator. But it is affected by all of the rest of our soul. And likewise, it goes in the reverse direction. If we have an experience that brings an onslaught of negative emotions, it will affect our thoughts and, in turn, our choices. But the same is true for beauty in, beauty out. If we surround ourselves with people who are telling us truths and encouraging us and lifting us up, if we're reading the Bible and if we're attending church or Bible study, then we're, our, our emotions will reflect that. We will feel encouraged, accepted, chosen, loved. And our will and our choices will reflect that as well. We may choose to serve others and lift others up because that's what, how we feel. God's word says he doesn't consider so much our physical dimension. He judges our hearts, which is our soul. Another word for soul can be heart if you're reading through the scripture. Proverbs 4.23 says, Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. That is why the soul is where the enemy plays around and messes with us the most. I mean, sure, he can affect our physical dimension. I mean, we live in a broken world. There's trauma and injury. There's illness and disease. But really, it's what happens in our soul, how we react to our physical trouble that matters the most. And that's where the enemy wants to get us. He wants to affect our will to draw closer to God and break that will. I'll give you a case in point. I'm going to share a more obscure story of mine. And I have to say that it's only obscure because I've made it so. I've spent the greater part of 25 years minimizing and masking the pain from this childhood story. In fact, I had to fight my editor tooth and nail to keep just a sliver of this story in my book because she was one of so many people in my past who have said, it doesn't matter. What's the big deal? This talk is more about me actually sharing this than it is about the story itself. And it made me wonder as I was preparing this, I wonder if some of you have meaningful stories that others have trivialized or the enemy has kept in hidden places so he can protect his playground. I wonder if some of you have unseen stories that crushed your soul, but your physical body remained unchanged so no one knows. I've always been someone who wants to dive deep with a few people and not go shallow and wide with many. Maybe it's because I'm an introvert. I don't know. But in childhood, I dove deep with one particular friend all through elementary school. We were best friends. We were neighbors. We grew up together. 
from at least kindergarten, if not preschool. When we were 12, it was the summer between our elementary school years and our middle school years. And I was riding my bike around our neighborhood. And it was a loop, and she and I both lived on this loop. And I was coming down the hill near her house, and she was outside with her next-door neighbor, and they were both talking at the mailbox. And this girl was a year older than us. And as I'm coming down the hill, I see my friend kind of turn her back so that I can't see her face. And as I'm riding closer, I hear these words. Don't look at her, and maybe she won't stop. Now, I had not known what I had done wrong. I had no inkling that there was a problem. I had no reason to think that she didn't want me to stop or want to be friends with me or anything like that. I had no red flags. And immediately, because of that circumstance, I went into an emotional tailspin. I started, I felt betrayed. I felt confused. I felt ashamed, I felt shocked, I felt sad, I felt embarrassed, I felt shunned and stunned, and certainly I felt abandoned. And if you remember those three components of the soul, those three parts, those feelings of mine triggered certain thoughts. Something is wrong with me, I'm not a good friend, I'm not likable. And for the next 25 years, my will and my choices and my actions were simply responses to those three thoughts. I built not just a wall, I built a fortress around my soul and heart. I shut off my feelings. In that picture, you might as well draw a big red square through the emotional section of my soul. I pretended I didn't care. And I gotta tell you, I went through the rest of my schooling with that girl beside me in my classes and passing each other in the holiday, hallways we never spoke again. I still have no idea what happened. So I decided to focus on other things. So I focused on school and academics. I focused on sports. And when I was a little older, I focused on dating. Because you see, I was leaving a trail of friends behind me. If a friend that I had become close to if, she had, if there was any indication that she was going to bring someone else into our circle or that she wanted to spend time with someone else, I ran. I can't even tell you why some of my friendships ended, but I just know that I sabotaged them because I wanted to leave the friendship before they left me. I didn't know that's what I was doing. And Kim would tell you, I guess I had learned to treat myself the way I had been mistreated by that 12-year-old friend. Well, I grew up, I moved to Charlotte, I got married, and in our early 20s, we befriended another couple here in Charlotte, and the wife and I became really close. You could say best friends. And it happened again. It was an abrupt end to a really close friendship, not by my choice, that I did not know was coming, at least this time she called to tell me. And all the old thoughts came rushing back. I'm not a good friend. There must be something wrong with me. I'm not likable. And guess what? It must be a decade thing because it happened again in my 30s. This time, though, God and I had become more intimate. I had a solid foundation of faith. That Holy Spirit in me was speaking louder than the lies. And Jesus showed me that, you know what? I am a good friend. In fact, Jesus not only loves me, he likes me. And sometimes to me, that's more important. So here's the crux of it all. Even now, right at this moment, my thoughts are in complete battle because I'm still standing here and thinking that you're thinking, so what? That's the battle I've been fighting. Big deal, you've lost a lot of friends. Well, here's the big deal. I'm now in my 40s, and it better not happen again. <laughs> I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Now, the, the big deal is two years ago, I had a breakthrough, like a huge breakthrough. My husband and I had just finished walking through our marriage crisis. 
and we had kind of come out the other side, and we wanted to be trained to become marriage mentors for the community. So we attended a week-long intensive marriage retreat in Atlanta. And by intensive, I mean intense. I mean, it was like 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. every day. It was exhausting. But we were there to learn, but there were three other couples who had gone because they were in crisis. And then there was a counselor couple. And during the course of the weekend, the counselors taught us about things called genogram. And we were supposed to do our own genogram. Now, a genogram is kind of a, a family tree, if you will. It's a picture of all the relationships that you were privy to. And so the counselor said, pick age 12 and kind of draw out, map out your genogram. So I said, great, I'll do that. Mine is not messy. And I'm not just saying that because my parents are here tonight. Mine was really, really nice. It was pretty. It had lots of bold lines that mean that I had strong relationships. I had strong relationships with my parents and with my brother. Um, there was no, like, direct um, impact from a divorce anywhere in my family tree. But I remember they said, draw it from when you were age 12. So I thought, ah, I'll just draw it in. So I drew a broken line, and I put a circle, and I put BFF to myself. And I wrote age 12. And I didn't really think much of it. I was really kind of just wanting to fit in with everyone else and wanted something messy <laughs> to present. <laughs> well, it was the last day. We had all gone through our genograms. Everyone had gotten some form of healing and counseling, and we had all discussed it. And we were on the very, we were minutes away from packing up our stuff and walking out the door to drive to whatever state we had come from. And the counselors were saying their goodbyes, and we were sitting in a circle, and I was looking over the counselor's head, and I saw all our genograms on the other side of the room, because they were facing me. And I just pinpointed my focus onto that broken line that I had drawn to that best friend when I was 12. And minutes before everyone was ready to leave and say goodbye, I started sobbing. <laughs> and everyone's looking at me like, are you kidding me? My husband's like, seriously? <laughs> and I realized I had never grieved that loss because I had stuffed it for so long. But even more important than that, God showed me something more unbelievable. You see, up until that point, all through my Christian faith walk since I was in college, if anyone refer, even, well, actually, even when I was in Sunday school as a kid, when everyone would say, you're a friend of God, Jesus is your friend, that produced a visceral reaction of negativity in me. I thought, oh, no, no, I do not want that. I need a Jesus Savior. Yes, I need that. I get Heavenly Father. I had an earthly father who modeled that wonderfully for me. Still does. He's not dead. He's over there. I even get Lord of Lords and King of Kings, even though we don't live in a kingdom. I get that. But do not tell me that Jesus is my friend, because that is not the kind of God I want. Well, in the past two years, I have learned in my quiet times with God what it means to have a friend in Jesus. You know, a close friend shares intimate secrets and doesn't betray trust. A close friend is someone who knows you and supports you and possibly, most importantly, challenges you. They stand by you when you're at your worst. They love you when you're at your best. And that's what Jesus does for me. So I must confess there are times when I have to fight against the thought that I'm not a worthy friend or that I'm not likable. I've learned that friendship starts and ends with a story, and in between are chapters built with trust and sacrifice and commitment. And I see that when I read the Bible. I see it in God's relationships with Abraham and Moses and David. I've learned to foster that kind of relationship with Christ where I feel more known than ever. If you'll put up the next slide, basically this is what's happened. That Holy Spirit connection, that relationship, that friendship that I've now fostered, the intimacy has grown. And I'm not saying that the Holy Spirit or God takes over our souls. No, he created us to be who we are. But what happens is our mind and our thoughts, our feelings and our emotions, and our will and our choices are more aligned with his. 
The more truth that we learn, the more truth we can live out. You'll go to the next slide. No longer do I call you servant, for the servant does not know what the master is doing, but I have called you friend. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. Jesus is my everything, including friend, even best friend, if I let him. I was lost, but now I'm not just found, I'm known. And I can't imagine there is anyone here who doesn't want to be known on all levels, in all dimensions. But I also realize that friend of God is not the only gap in our relationship intimacy with him. I am fully aware that for some of you, it's going to be Daddy God or Heavenly Father because that's where your earthly relationship kind of fed lies into what you might believe God is like. For some of you, it might be Savior. And here's, there's, there's a continuum of lies. Some of you might fall on one continuum where you think, I have done so much wrong that I can't, I'm not even worthy of a savior. And that's a lie. And there are others of you on the other content side of this continuum where you say, I don't need a savior. I'm a good person. You know, I give to charity and I volunteer. I haven't murdered anyone. But that's a lie too because we all fall short of the glory of God, and it's only Jesus who can bridge that gap. You know, as an author, writer, and speaker, it's my desire to leave an impression and to point you to God. We're all here to help you encounter Jesus, not just hear about him, but actually encounter him. So if you walk out these doors, and you feel pretty good and warm and fuzzy, and you go to bed, and you wake up in the morning, but nothing has changed, then we all have a problem. You know, a former pastor of mine once said in his sermon, we cannot encounter God and remain the same. We choose to either grow in our faith journey or we choose to shrink back in doubt, but we cannot meet Jesus and remain neutral. I want us all to encounter God and grow. So if you don't know Jesus as Lord, Savior, or friend, I want to give you a chance to do that now. Whatever part of God you're minimizing because of a soul wound, I'm here to claim reconciliation for you. Or if you're someone who's been minimizing or hiding a soul wound, I'm here to say it's okay to tell your story. Your story matters. It doesn't have to be a huge, draw-dropping story that shocks people, like some of my other stories. It might be. But even our smaller stories matter. Every story matters. Don't let the enemy keep them in the dark in his playground. Every soul wound needs the truth and the light to hit it, to gain full healing. And don't let others judge which of your stories are worth telling, because they all are.